uh, Norman and I met um, at uh, NSA comedy event uh, about eight years ago. Before making fun of the NSA was uh, kosher, we uh, held an event where we talked about surveillance and Big Brother watching. So Norman, thank you so much for joining us tonight. He is the co-founder of RootsAction.org, as well as um, Public Accuracy and Reporting. And uh, thank you, Norman, for joining hey, us tonight. Thank you, Vahid, and I'm really glad to be uh, part of Ethics in Tech event again. You know, I'm going to mostly talk about U.S. media coverage of the Middle East. What's wrong with that coverage is very much what is wrong with U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, and that is a failure to have a single standard of human rights. If there was a single standard, uh, then we'd have a much more realistic view uh, from the United States of what's going on in the Middle East. We'd understand U.S. policy better. And I think we, in the long run, we would be much, most of what I understand about the Middle East and U.S. coverage is from reading and listening to people. I haven't been in the Middle East that much. Uh, somebody who has been, who we're going to hear from in a little while, is really a great journalist, Reese Ehrlich. And for instance, his book uh, titled The Iran Agenda Today is really a wonderful synthesis of eyewitness reporting and history and analysis. I did get to visit Iran uh, in 2009 and for about 10 days was in Tehran uh, during the uh, ill-fated election that brought to, if not power, at least the presidency, uh, Ahmadinejad. And a couple of moments I wanted to mention briefly, being in a, in a bazaar there and a, a salesperson for some uh, underwear uh, said to me, people around the world want peace and the governments are what get in the way, which on one hand sounds maybe like a cliche, but very heartfelt and I think very true. Um, I was at a human rights demonstration uh, held by women who were being brutalized by the police. That was also another reality that was very striking to me in Tehran. Um, I think about being in Iraq in 2002 in the autumn and going to a water treatment plant and uh, speaking said, uh, well, well, you're so strong. I mean, this was a water treatment plant that was basically national thanks to U.S. Um, sanctions. And when the uh, Iraqi woman was said, uh, was told, uh, you're so strong. Uh, she said, no, we're not strong. We're, we're, we're like anybody else. We were, uh, who took us around Baghdad. And then we were in the middle of a, a park and it was just me and me, just, just two of us have oil. You know, by that point it was clear that an invasion was coming. He said, all these in the past and in the future, uh, in the country of Iraq. And I think of going over the Allenby bridge and, there on the border is a 19-year-old from Brooklyn, New York, with a rifle uh, telling me that Palestinians should get out of his country, and he didn't mean the United States. He meant Israel. And I thought of going and went to East Jerusalem and saw while the women were standing in line for something. And I think of Mordecai Vanunu, who spent, what, two decades in prison, mostly in solitary confinement for the crime of disclosing to the world that Israel had nuclear weapons. And here we have the United States threatening Iran for the uh, crime or the allegation of thinking about or endeavoring perhaps maybe to be doing uranium enrichment for nuclear weapons. So. It goes to the question in so many ways of single standards, whether human rights or anything else that is put out there self-righteously by the U.S. government and echoed by the U.S. media comes through the TV, radio, newspapers, big online media outlets in the United States. So much of it is filtered through the, the grid of what we are told is reality out of Washington, out of the think tanks, uh, out of uh, preconceived notions of 
good and bad, and good is usually doing what the United States government wants, and bad is the opposite. And we have this tremendous challenge. I think there's been some progress, certainly in the last years and decades, in shifting the narrative in media. And I don't think we should discount the importance of the independent media uh, that have so often chipped away at the deceptions, the lies, the distortions, the stereotypes that have under have fueled the militarism, the war, the subsidies for governments like the Saudi government, uh, tolerated or funded armed uh, wars uh, against Yemen, uh, creating all sorts of disasters and reinforcing the injustice and elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, I think that as discouraging as things often are, that the potential is partially being realized to shift the narratives that then can shift the policies. And that comes from, I think, activism, uh, messaging to members of Congress and other elected officials, and fighting against uh, the sort of the default positions, which are uh, any friend of the Israeli government is a friend of the United States, and any enemy is therefore an enemy. When we look at the Iran nuclear deal and how it almost got uh, derailed the first time around and how we now have obstacles to reinstating it, so much of it really, not all of it, but so much of it is that there's a default knee-jerk position from many people in media and a substantial portion of the Congress that if the Israeli government doesn't want it to happen, it shouldn't happen. And so we have that tremendous uh, uh, challenge to continually push up against that. And then there is the equation of uh, Zionism and Judaism, which is fomented and encouraged by a lot of mainline uh, Jewish institutions in the United States and in much of the U.S. media, and also uh, certainly by the Israeli government. Uh, and so then it becomes a shield to claim that criticism against Israel is anti-Semitic. And uh, one of the great ironies, of course, is that uh, a lot of Christian Zionism, quote unquote, and uh, some of the most important political support for Israel in the United States is coming from sources who on their own are basically anti-Semitic or anti-Israel, but they see Israel as a tool or whatever uh, biblical fulfillment they uh, foresee. So, you know, I, I'd really just emphasize that as, as discouraging as things may be, uh, that they would be a lot worse if there hadn't been uh, tremendous media work being done. And, you know, I'd just, for instance, by, by Rhys Ehrlich, by outlets like Common Dreams, by many people who are working in the vineyard, so to speak, around this country and beyond who are saying, no, we're not going to just accept the official narrative. We are not going to defer to what's coming out of the uh, government of the United States and elsewhere that fuel war that fuel uh, xenophobia and hostility to people who have uh, different systems than we do. And also uh, saying that whether it's in the media or political arenas, we can really make a difference. And I think that's, that's clear. And of course, we've got a lot, a lot of work to do. So, uh, so onward and upward. Thank you so much, Norman. I really appreciate your time tonight. And uh, you're right.